Our feature guest this evening is Dr. James Eubanks, who serves as academic chief resident at the UPMC Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation Residency Program. He received his MD from the Brody School of Medicine at East Carolina University. Dr. Eubanks' clinical interests include spine and musculoskeletal medicine, neurorehabilitation, and medically complex rehabilitation. His research interests include high-value spine and musculoskeletal care, spine care, chronic pain, and assistive technology. Dr. So and Dr. Eubanks, thank you so much for being with us today. Dr. So, the floor is yours. Tonight is particularly unique for us to have one of our trainees present during our rehab reels, but Dr. Eubanks is particularly a unique clinician in many ways. He's had an interesting background, having trained and practiced as a chiropractor prior to attending medical school in our residency program, which as you heard, he's now our academic chief resident. He's importantly, he's already made a national and international name for himself in spine care and musculoskeletal care, particularly related to policy development and education of spine care professionals. And he's demonstrated outstanding leadership and evolving models of care, which you'll get to hear about tonight. He's lived these values in enhancing care for patients with a truly transdisciplinary approach for spine and musculoskeletal conditions, which means his impact has extended already even beyond the individual patients that he's cared for. So we're so pleased um, that he will be staying here at Pitt and UPMC as our value-based spine care fellow next year, followed by joining our faculty in 2023. So we couldn't be more thrilled uh, that he'll be staying and continuing both his educational pursuits, um, his training, mentorship, as well as clinical care here. Um, and you'll hear more about this today. And I know you're going to love hearing his perspectives today. So I look forward to his talk and the dialogue that we'll have afterwards. Dr. Eubanks, please. Thank you all very much. Um, so it's a pleasure to be speaking tonight about my journey to physiatry. And uh, these are some of my perspectives that I've gained um, as I've come into healthcare and transitioned from uh, my role as a chiropractor uh, into a PM&R resident, almost um, graduate of the residency at this point. So a brief overview of my educational background. I actually studied philosophy in undergrad and I had some early exposure to um, counseling and mindfulness training which is important to a lot of um, how I think through some of the problems we face with chronic pain. I then completed a doctor of chiropractic degree and master's in sports science and rehabilitation out in St. Louis at Logan University. At the time, I was also a certified strength and conditioning specialist. And so I became very comfortable with um, exercise prescription, which is also an important skill in rehabilitation. I then completed medical school, as mentioned, at Brody School of Medicine, and am now completing my residency. So a lot of us, I think, expect life to, to unfold in a fairly linear way with us making progress as we move forward. But in reality, it's probably more like this. It's up and down, and we make progress over time. Um, and depending on what's happening in life, it may appear to be more productive uh, or not. And so it, it evolves and changes, but sometimes it can be even more chaotic than that. And we can feel like we're just bouncing around. But I think what I would like to emphasize is that there's no one particular way for things to unfold. And that's my personal history and background in healthcare. And so I want to share that with you tonight. And it started off as me being a patient myself. And so I was an otherwise healthy 17-year-old in high school. I was playing lacrosse, very active. Um, and then seemingly overnight or over the matter of just a few days, I started to feel very ill. Um, I had a fever and then woke up one morning with excruciating abdominal pain and could barely walk. And so I made it to the ED and found out that I had a very unusual presentation of Crohn's disease, which is an autoimmune condition where my body was essentially attacking itself. Um, for me, it was in the small intestines or small bowel. And the highlighted portion there 
is the terminal ilium. And I actually had about a foot of that um, terminal ilium removed um, quite urgently um, due to severe infection. And that changed the trajectory of my life. It certainly made me start thinking very differently about health because this was going to be a fairly prolonged experience for me. Um, I ended up over the course of about six years being hospitalized six times and had to have two more surgeries due to complications from the initial procedure. And that really changed my thinking. So as a patient, I learned certain values and realized what meant the most to me as I was going through my experience. Um, there's a really great model um, where we consider the patient at the center of care, and that's laid out here very nicely as care that's collaborative, coordinated, and accessible. We want to consider the physical comfort and emotional well-being. Patient and family viewpoints must be respected and valued. The patient and family should always be included in decisions. And this was really a crucial understanding um, that I developed um, and continue to hold as a physician. The family must be welcome in the care setting. We want transparency and fast delivery of information, something we're continually trying to improve on. And we wanna make sure that the mission and values are aligned with the patient goals. And so ultimately, as Francis Peabody said, one of the essential qualities of the clinician is interest in humanity. And for the secret of the care of the patient, it is in caring for the patient. And this is something that I learned through my own experience and carried forward with me in my healthcare training, which started as a chiropractor. And part of that was due to the synergy that I um, developed for behavioral change and health promoting behaviors, uh, more of a non interventional approach to healthcare. Um, there was also the important recognition that uh, as I was an undergrad and actually started um, chiropractic school up until about halfway through, I was still being hospitalized intermittently. There was a lot of learning going on for me in terms of what I was experiencing and how I should best handle it. Um, I saw lots of different specialists and tried to get um, good advice on what I should be doing to make sure that I could live my life to the fullest. And that was very hard, hard for me to obtain. Um, and so I had a difficult time and it took me many years to really figure out lessons that I hope I'm able to provide my own patients um, in a much more efficient way now as a healthcare provider myself. One of the things that was attractive to me though, pursuing chiropractic was the prevalence of musculoskeletal disease. And the fact is that it is the prominent reason that people seek healthcare. And so I felt that it was a good avenue to reach people and to connect with patients because it was a very common um, issue for them to seek care for. And so I felt like I could be a change agent by pursuing that. Just for those who are not as familiar with chiropractic or maybe don't understand it fully, it has a storied history, but there are some core concepts that can help us understand. So vitalism, which is the body can repair itself, is important in all strains of chiropractic. Additionally, holism, something we're probably more familiar with, which is the sum is greater than the parts. There's this uh, prevailing notion of therapeutic conservatism, which is you wanna employ the lowest level of intervention for the best probable outcome. There is a focus on humanism or being patient-centered, particularly now in the 21st century. And then something that has become more important to both the chiropractic and physical therapy and occupational therapy uh, professions is this concept of biopsychosocial health. And this is uh, something that was developed by George Engel um, in the late 70s at um, the University of Rochester. 
And it says that we need to consider the biological, psychological, and sociological factors that play into the experience that a patient has with health and illness. And so I actually worked with one of my mentors here at Pitt, um, Michael Schneider, who's the second author there, um, and another group on trying to articulate what it means to practice in a biopsychosocial minded way within the profession. So the current definition of chiropractic as defined by the American Chiropractic Association is the doctors of chiropractic, uh, referred to as chiropractors, practice a drug-free hands-on approach to healthcare that includes patient examination, diagnosis, and treatment within scope. Chiropractors have a broad diagnostic skill set, and they're trained to recommend therapeutic and rehabilitative exercises and provide nutritional, dietary, and lifestyle counseling. And that was really the ethos um, from which I entered chiropractic. This is how I envisioned you know, my practice of healthcare playing out. And uh, for the most part is what I pursued in practice after I, I graduated. Chiropractic is accredited now. Uh, there are standards that actually have been adopted by the World Health Organization, and there are some really good examples of integrated settings for training purposes um, outside of the U.S., um, as demonstrated here, the University of Southern Denmark and Zurich are some really um, important examples of that. All U.S. schools, similarly to medical school, require 90 credit hours of undergraduate training. Doctor of chiropractic a degree is four years of training, similar to medicine in that the first two years are more basic science and the second two years are more clinical, but there are some important differences. So there's no required clinical residency. In the scope of topics and depth um, to which we are exposed clinically is, is much narrower than in medicine. And it's important for me to note, having been through both trainings at this point, that most of the training in medicine actually occurs during residency and not medical school. And so you have to consider that when you're thinking about the comparisons. The other important comparison is that chiropractic is focused more on the musculoskeletal system exclusively. They do have board exams, just like in medicine. They are licensed in all 50 states now. And there are postgraduate training options. Two of the better ones, I think, are the VA system, which has several locations across the country, um, I believe, for a two-year um, time investment for trainees to really learn how to practice musculoskeletal medicine within sort of a primary care context. The other important example I'll go into a little bit more is the primary spine practitioner certification program here at the University of Pittsburgh. In terms of scope, they are considered portal of entry, which means someone can walk into a chiropractic office off the street. They do therefore have a duty to diagnose, especially ruling out red flags. Performing crucial diagnostic testing when appropriate, making appropriate referrals to physicians. And the data suggests that actually most chiropractors are pretty good about referring to physicians when needed. And then these are some of the listings of the more important roles that chiropractors play in the conservative management of patients. And that is, of course, joint manipulation and mobilization of the spine, as most people will know, um, but also rehabilitation, exercise-based therapy, patient education and lifestyle modification, uh, orthotics and physical modalities may be used, self-care strategies, and goal setting. All right, so stepping back to what I mentioned just a moment ago about the primary spine practitioner program. So this is really important in the context of spine care being really our number one disease burden, not just in the United States, but uh, globally. And so this program was developed to provide chiropractors as well as physical therapists, and it's housed within our physical therapy school here, um, more devoted training to dealing with spine-related disorders in a guideline concordant manner. This concept was championed in part by Professor Mike Schneider, who's one of my longtime mentors here in the PIT system, 
And these practitioners are utilized currently in the program for spine health, which is led by our own Dr. Standard here in the department of PM&R. So in my personal experience, something that really transformed me was my exposure to my mentor, Craig Brigham, who was the uh, spine chief at Ortho Carolina in Charlotte. So after I finished my chiropractic training, I went back to Charlotte where I'd gone to high school and I pretty much immediately connected with Craig Brigham. I attended, interestingly, I, I attended the um, local spine conference at the orthopedic mm -hmm. hospital the month before I was to start practice. And I said, to people who are attending, you know, who's the best educator here? Because I knew being fresh out of school, I needed to learn as much as I possibly could. And they said, they pointed, and it happened to be the guy lecturing that day. And it was Craig Brigham. I went up after he gave an excellent talk and actually mentioned the word biopsychosocial. Um, and I introduced myself and I said, do you mind if I come hang out in clinic sometime? And after he was initially surprised at a chiropractor asking him that, he said, of course, absolutely. And so that was the beginning of a really important mentorship um, that I had from 2010 to 2013. And so during my training with Dr. Brigham, he realizes that um, I, I appreciated the indications for surgery, but wasn't um, too interested in, in becoming a surgeon. But we had started thinking through the fact that my health was better and maybe I needed to consider going back to medical school. The main reason there was for this important notion of cultural authority, which is that if you want to lead real change in a sort of systemic manner, you've got to have the cultural authority to get people to um, understand what you're saying and to really get behind it. And so the, the conversation moves towards me going back to medical school. And he says, well, you need to go to Boston and meet my friend, Jim Rainville. So I, I get on a plane in 2011 and I go to Boston and I spend some time with Jim Rainville, who is the director of the spine, non-operative spine program at New England Baptist Hospital. And so that really changed me. And unfortunately, Dr. Brigham passed away unexpectedly in 2013, just a couple of weeks before I actually took the MCAT. Um, and uh, that, that was a hard, hard, moment, but uh, the lessons that he was able to um, share with me over the course of our, our time together uh, continue to inform who I am and how I think through uh, my priorities as a physician. So this is an excerpt from a journal, uh, a medical journal that came out um, that quoted Dr. Brigham, and I wanted to share it. So he says, I'm a big advocate of education. I've seen many patients who have either failed interventional treatments or have not responded well to surgery because those were not the most appropriate steps to take when trying to resolve their back pain. While surgery is indicated for certain diagnoses, the evidence shows that surgery is not helpful in resolving general back pain. What patients truly need is good information regarding their test results, diagnosis, and available options. And that really summarizes um, what he was about and, and why he meant so much to me as I was training. So I actually tried to capture some of his core teachings in a chapter that I wrote for a book called The Meanings of Pain. This happened to be volume two of a three volume series. And um, so Dr. Brigham taught that we need to have an honest assessment of the clinical problem with a focus on best evidence treatment options. That is, how do we think through this with biopsychosocial insight? We need to have and employ an understandable plain language to really improve patient communication. He always liked to say, what are you going to say to the patient? And interestingly, he first introduced me to this concept of working with insurance or working with the payers, trying to think through the um, the payment priorities that really dictate a lot of our clinical behaviors. This, this time when I was with him was when ACOs were kind of coming in to fashion, and it was right before um, the Affordable Care Act was made legal. Also provide realistic reassurance and hope that patients can participate in their own recovery. 
And that's a crucial lesson because it's something that we as physiatrists carry very close to our heart. So a bit about my experience with Dr. Jim Rainville, who unfortunately retired as of this year, but has a quite the legacy that he left in Boston. So Jerome Groupman is the chair of medicine at Harvard Medical School, and he suffered cr with chronic low back pain for about 20 years. And in 1999, went to see a rheumatologist in Boston who said, okay, you now need to go see Jim Rainville. And Dr. Groupman um, sort of uh, catalogs his experience in this book that he wrote, which was a New York Times bestseller called The Anatomy of Hope, which I highly recommend. And so this is the excerpt that I'd like to read. You are worshiping the volcano god of pain. This is what uh, was told to Dr. Grootman. And he says, I had been warned that Rainville was a brash in your face clinician. What do I mean that you're worshiping the volcano god of pain? You interpret pain as a red flag, a warning that you are doing damage to your body. So you sacrifice things that you love, activities that give your life joy to be kept free from pain. You say to the volcano god, I will give up walking long distances if you keep me out of pain. I will give up lifting my children if you keep me out of pain. I will give up travel because long trips stress my spine. Just keep me from pain. But this God is never fully satisfied with any offering. It is appeased only for a short while. So the more you sacrifice, the more the God demands until your life contracts as it has into a very, very narrow space. But I believe you can be freed from your pain I believe you can rebuild yourself and do much, much more. So Grootman wrote about this and actually went through this rehabilitation program at New England Baptist uh, that Dr. Rainville led and um, credits it with his coming out of 20 years of chronic low back pain and really regaining his life back. This is the kind of experience I had. So I go up there and I see this, this program in full force. And it's pretty amazing because you are, you are really witnessing um, people changing their, their, their life in a remarkable way um, that is premised on their own empowerment. And so that message quickly resonated with me. And I said to myself at that point, this is what I wanna do with my career. And so that's how I, I really developed uh, the energy that I needed to commit an, another 10 years of my life, um, really, to getting my training. All right. So my clinical exposure up to this point, I was an associate clinician at Priester Chiropractic in Charlotte, which was um, about a half mile from Ortho Carolina Spine Center, which is where I ended up meeting Craig Brigham. So Craig Brigham, in his selflessness, developed a fairly robust program for me. Um, and I've outlined it in short here. I actually have uh, about 13 pages of the various topics and things that uh, were included in this um, clinical fellowship, if you will, that I actually went through. Um, and it, it was a remarkable experience. In fact, we tried to get this um, funded in a way that would allow other people after me to continue with it. And we found the funding. And so Mike Schneider was instrumental in this process, which began in 2011. Um, but unfortunately, because of Dr. Brigham's passing, uh, it was cut short. I also had some experiences with um, uh, clinical review, as well as developing guidelines. And so I worked with a company called uh, CareCore National, which is now called EVCore Healthcare in their musculoskeletal medicine division, developing guidelines. Uh, and that was a really instrumental experience for me, appreciating the role that health policy um, and health economics play in driving clinical behaviors. Okay, so now I'm moving into the physiatry world. Many of you may know what physiatry is, but just to give you a quick summary, our goal is to prevent, diagnose, and treat disorders that may produce temporary or permanent impairments. In terms of our training, we have four years of medical school after our undergraduate training. 
We then pursue residency in PM&R and really the number of residencies continues to grow and develop uh, in some remarkable ways. And so when I started my process around 2014, um, going back to medical school, I think there were around 72 or 71 programs and now we're approaching 100. We've got several more that are um, starting up for next year. This includes a one-year internship. Typically, that's in medicine. And then we do three years of devoted pm &R training. Typically, that's divided um, up between half inpatient, roughly, and half outpatient medicine. We also have the opportunity to do fellowship. I think the last time I checked, about 40% of people go into fellowship still. So the physiatric approach Patient function and quality of life are really primary. That's our focus. That's what we do. That's our quote organ system. We uh, work really well in teams. We need teams to do the work that we do. And so we also have to have a fairly robust knowledge base. We're kind of like primary care in some ways. And on the inpatient side, at least, we do function uh, almost on the spectrum of a hospitalist. We combine pharmacological and non-pharmacological modalities, of course, non-surgical approaches to treatment and rehabilitation. And we may do certain procedures like EMG, uh, musculoskeletal ultrasound or joint injections. But importantly, and again, on the inpatient side and increasingly we have good examples on the outpatient side, we work and coordinate interdisciplinary treatment teams with lots of the um, specialists and professionals that allow us to do our job better. So as I'm going through my training, I'm thinking about how do I apply my lessons that I learned um, during my, my clinical practice as a chiropractor, being trained by an orthopedist, working with um, industry to develop guidelines. And, and evidence-based medicine is really one of the most important compasses that we have to use to try to understand what's good um, and what's not so good when it comes to clinical care. And so evidence-based medicine is this idea that we can develop, uh, hopefully, a universal standard. Um, we want to promote guidelines that combine both best care uh, and best science. And then we also want to think about cost effectiveness. So if two treatments work, which costs less? And this is a, a schematic showing how those may overlap to hopefully give us evidence-based medicine. The, these are the three elements of evidence-based medicine. We think about clinical experience. We think about the research base or the best evidence itself. We think about also the patient values, kind of thinking back to the first part of the talk. And we do have some really good examples now of what that looks like in practice. And I think it's important um, for trainees like myself as we move forward into our uh, role as an attending that we think through application of evidence-based medicine in ways that work for the type of clinical care that we're providing. So this one in particular um, is from 2019 that's been quite popular uh, to, to explain how we might use evidence-based practices uh, for musculoskeletal medicine. And um, we'll kind of jump to the next slide here where I talk about my research training. So I, in, in my exposure to uh, Craig Brigham and, and Jim Rainville, I'm understanding that there's this real gap um, out in the field when it comes to studying what they're what they are trying to do clinically and so that's how I developed my own research interest I actually did not have much of a research um, background prior to medicine um, but as soon as I went back to medical school I tried to get involved um, in as many ways as I could one of the most important ways was being a medical extern at Northwestern which was still um, the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago at that time and this was 2015, um, right when the opioid um, epidemic was coming to light. And there was a lot of interest about how we stop 
using opioids um, in certain patient populations. And so I ended up winning a research award for that, for some work I did with uh, Jim Atchison, who was the medical director of the pain program there at the time. I then pursued a clinical research track while I was at Brody and won a medical um, student award in 2018 for some work that we did um, looking at a required clerkship for uh, medical students in pm &R and actually implementing a lifestyle medicine intervention. So that's what that was for. Um, and now as a resident, I am in our clinical research track, which includes uh, the Rehabilitation Medicine Scientist Training Program through the Association of Academic Physiatrists. And I'm working with uh, Mike Schneider on prehabilitation for patients who are undergoing surgery for lumbar spinal stenosis. These are a few examples of the research activities. So this is a poster actually from uh, North, my time at Northwestern that was presented. Um, I've had some really great opportunities to get involved in different ways. So for techniques and orthopedics, I have helped them develop a visual abstract series. Um, and this has actually dramatically increased the number of people who both visit their site and subscribe to their journal. And so the, the bottom box here is basically taking a prose abstract um, from a particular um, article and putting it into a single um, PowerPoint or PDF slide that can be presented a bit more efficiently. And that's what that is. This year, uh, of course, with COVID, some of our conferences are virtual. This was a poster that was presented at the International Back and Neck Pain Forum, um, and Mike, Dr. Mike Schneider was involved with that. Um, and I also am a reviewer for the Spine Journal, and then I was um, asked by Dr. Jana Friedley, who's the editor-in-chief of PM&R Journal, um, to help as an associate editor starting this year with a new focus on value-based spine care. And so I feel that's really instrumental um, in both showing progress in terms of the interest that our journals have, but also um, providing me some more of the training that I would like to get to do good work in that space. And then finally, as a chief resident and someone interested in research, um, attending academic conferences are very important to me. And so these are just some of the examples. I did on the, on the left here, um, that's actually from the Dutch um, Insurance Medicine Conference that happens once a year um, in the Netherlands. And I was asked to come speak to them um, because the president of their organization heard me speak at one of the pm &R conferences um, and they asked me to come be a keynote speaker. And so that was a tremendously um, valuable experience for me. I got to learn more about their health system. We exchanged some ideas and I also got to meet one of my other research mentors, Rob Smeets, who's the chair of rehabilitation at Maastricht University while I was there. And I wanna thank uh, Dr. Soa and the department for supporting us um, as trainees in our ability to do that. So where are we now? So this is fascinating to me. Um, when when uh, my mentor, Craig Brigham died, his family gave me his educational materials. And I was looking back through some of them recently and I came across these slides. And so November 7th, almost you know, exactly 10 years ago, he and his colleague, Dr. Leo Spector, presented to their partners at Ortho Carolina this proposal where they wanted to try to get me in to help them focus on the things that I talked about earlier, uh, patient education, lifestyle change, um, and, and goal setting um, that was, that was um, something they struggled to provide their patients with. And so they made this proposal to their partners 10 years ago. And you'll see that he kind of talks about um, me being in the process of medical school, wanting to do physiatry. Yes, even then I knew I wanted to do physiatry. Um, but you'll note that he says the ultimate goal of this 
was the development of a non-procedurally based spine diagnostics and clinical management fellowship or think non-operative orthopedic fellowship based on ACGME guidelines. So 10 years ago, this was a thought, an idea. And uh, describing this further, they wanted to lead the way in healthcare reform, interface with PCPs in a cost-effective way, no over-treatment for self-limited conditions or, or chronic pain. Um, they wanted to integrate things like CBT and, um, and not just be kind of an end-stage catch-all for patients, but really transform their life in a more meaningful way uh, with a focus on health. And so then we look at where we are now, and here at UPMC, we have this value-based fellowship in spine and musculoskeletal medicine, which essentially is doing much of what um, Craig Brigham was hoping might be possible. Um, and we're doing it. And this is really exciting because my journey has taken me um, in many different places, and I've met some really outstanding people along the way. Uh, but to be where I am right now after 10 years of, of this um, is pretty much exactly how I could have scripted it to play out. Um, so I want to thank Dr. Standard for developing this program and really seeing it through. And um, I want to thank Dr. Soa for having me tonight. And I look forward to chatting with you if anyone has any further questions. Uh, and that's my baby daughter, who's now five months old, um, they're trying to uh, learn how to read. <laughs> Jim, thank you so much. That was, that was awesome. And uh, your passion for this work is truly um, inspiring. And thanks for sharing your personal story um, as well, because I think for so many of us, this influences the way we care for patients and the way we think about care approaches in general. So I think that was really instructive um, for me and for the group to, to hear your personal journey um, on the other side of medicine. So um, I wonder, as people are thinking of questions and feel free to post things um, in the Q&A and, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, I wonder, uh, maybe I'll kick the discussion off and just ask, you know, as you're, as you're pursuing and completing now your residency and UNR, um, how has this helped you achieve your overall goals? And importantly, how do, how do you think about combining your two backgrounds? That's, that's a really good question. So for me, I think there, being a chiropractor um, forced me to develop certain skills that are really valuable to me as a physiatrist now. Um, I had to rely on a good history and physical. I had to rely on a good patient relationship. I had to collaborate well because I was in a profession that did not have the uh, luxury of just having easy access. And so those skills, I think, are important whenever we're charting new territory. So as we think through what does it mean to be value-based or what does it mean to practice in a way that's more guideline concordant, that is going to require relationship building mm -hmm. and good communication. And so those are the things that I definitely refined I, I hope <laughs> from my time as a chiropractor before medicine that I get to just expand upon at this point and use to hopefully advance new goals as they come up. Absolutely. Yeah. That communication piece is so critical in the care of our patients. There's no question. I wonder, you talked a little bit about patient centered care and, and, you know, to your point of the importance of everyone being on the same page and developing that collaboration, that communication, wonder if you could talk a little bit about when it's not so easy. Um, there's no easy answers in spine care and in pain, care of pain um, in general. And what happens when different providers disagree or family members disagree? How do you, how do you work to achieve consensus in that setting? So that's a great question and one that we face frequently. Um, and so I think our first responsibility there 
is to find common ground, really try to establish some common ground. Um, I think we also have to employ patience and try to take a step back from any immediate uh, response that we might feel because a lot of times there are emotions involved with these tough moments. And so this is something that I think we get a lot of practice with on the inpatient side, because we're dealing with very difficult moments in life for people. Um, and so one thing that seems to be really important is, is to remember the overarching goal of uh, achieving something together, um, but also giving people space to process change. So sometimes it's a matter of me uh, uh, withholding, you know, my own impulse to respond and, and to wait for a better time to deliver that information. Um, and so I think that's really important, particularly when it comes to dealing with um, tough patient situations. When it comes to our colleagues, I think we have to think uh, long-term always with our colleagues. And that is that if we wanna shift culture or, or move culture in a new direction, that's, that's an investment over time. It's always an investment over time. And it's never going to be one conversation that makes all the change happen. It's going to be an ongoing conversation. And so I think that's how I can retain a little more optimism is that I don't need to feel like everything needs to change right now. I can have a goal in mind and then make steps, you know, one at a time that are going to hopefully start moving things in that direction. Um, and then also recognizing that sometimes I need to give to get. And that there might be ways that I can um, help my, my collaborators um, just as I hope that they'll be able to help me as well. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> no, that's, a, that's a very interesting perspective of, of having to provide something into that relationship and into that collaboration to get, the, get what you need out of it that's, right. and get the optimal outcome. And there's no question optimal versus feasible and meeting patients where they are is, is so, so important. Um, I wonder if I could switch gears a little bit and there's a few uh, questions in the Q&A that are um, a little more um, practical in terms of training approaches and how you get to a point where, like where you are. Um, so one of one of the attendees um, first congratulates you on your accomplishments um, and and has no doubt that you'll be continue to be a force uh, in the field of rehabilitation medicine, which I happen to agree with. Um, and then the question is um, related to um, people with similar backgrounds, um, in particular chiropractic, might you offer some insight into how someone might optimize their marketability, if you will, their competitiveness for a PMR residency program? Yeah, so I think the, the, the first thing to do is to reach out and, and show interest. So there are going to be programs out there that are looking for trainees who are hungry for experience and opportunities. And so um, trying to connect with programs uh, and, and see how receptive they are to allowing you, you know, to perhaps um, do a rotation or to talk with some of their their own residents, um, which is something I think pretty common is that a lot of residency programs are very good now about connecting you with people in the program who can talk with you more um, and, and are familiar with the, the recency of having gone through that themselves. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of a, a pragmatic uh, consideration there. And you really just have to try. You really just have to reach out and try to connect and, and see what happens um, and be genuine because most programs are going to recognize 
folks that are genuinely interested in this field and want to invest themselves in it. Um, and so I think that's kind of the take home point. Yeah, no, it's, it's a great point. I think asking, getting in there and asking questions, people who are boots on the ground can make such a, such a big impact. There's another question about um, kind of approaching the field. And that is, you know, as PM&R, as you mentioned, that there's a big, been a big growth. We're seeing an uh, increase in residency training programs. We're also seeing an increase in the competitiveness of those residency training programs. Right. So what, what can medical students do to really get that early exposure, learn more about the field early and kind of separate themselves? Um, since, you know, for many people, maybe their program doesn't have, um, PM&R there locally, or um, they don't learn about it until what feels like a little late. So how can they increase their early exposure to make them a very competitive applicant? Yes. So first of all, trying to connect locally with anyone that you do have around uh, makes the most sense. Um, but additionally, as a medical student becomes aware that this is a field that they are really attracted to, um, trying to get involved with the conferences, particularly AAP and R AAP, is a really good avenue to take. So both of those conferences um, and, and professional societies have um, committees or structures for medical students um, that are led by medical students and try to address the needs of medical students. And so I think connecting with AAP and R and AAP as soon as you start to figure out that this is a field you want to go into is a really smart and efficient move because they have consolidated a lot of the resources that you'll need. And that's one of my, my best pieces of advice right there. Um, I benefited a lot by getting involved early myself. Um, you don't have to start attending necessarily right away or anything, but I think planning for an attend attendance at one of those conferences um, as a third year would be ideal or definitely in the fall of fourth year. Um, and then of course, reaching out and learning from those who are more senior to you that are already involved. That's, that's, a, that's a pretty good way to go about that, I think. Yeah, I would, I would agree with you. Those are very high yield opportunities, not just to learn more about the field, but from a networking and learning perspective to get involved very early. So it's, it's a great suggestion. And, and then I guess one more quick thought on that is, is uh, student interest groups. Mm -hmm. So we've seen a lot of people in schools that don't have home programs create student interest groups where, especially now since COVID, one nice thing is that we can set up Zoom meetings with people to talk to your, your program. And uh, I know that the University of South Carolina Medical School did this this past year, um, as well as a school in California that's uh, fairly new, just started in 2017. And so neither have their own home program. And what they did is they created an interest group and then used Zoom as a vehicle to connect with people across the country, essentially bring them in. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And there are certainly programs through both organizations, as you mentioned, to help facilitate that as well. No, that's great. And I think, you know, also not underestimating the impact medical students can have in the field. Yourself, a case in point, um, with some of the impact and some of the great work that you did while still a medical student that really had, had a significant impact on where the field was going and the trajectory. So. Even, even more than just learning about it, you can contribute to it. So That's right. Absolutely. You talked about the fellowship program. And of course, I'm so excited about this, about this program. Um, we're in our first year. You'll be our second fellow. And this is such an exciting um, training opportunity to integrate with the, the all, basically all the stakeholders that are important in moving this right. forward. So I wonder if you could talk a little more about the education that's going to come um, through this unique fellowship program. This, there was someone asking in the chat about that. Yes, of course. So um, there is a major clinical training component to this, and that is, you know, developing the skills needed to be a, a, a good outpatient spine and musculoskeletal physiatrist. Um, and that's about 70% of the time, but 30% of the time, and what makes this really unique is the fact that there is training with the health plan. 
And that is learning about health policy and what drives decisions around that policy. And I think this is really something that, first of all, more physicians need to be involved in this conversation. More physicians need the skill set to help drive some of those decisions. And this fellowship aims to provide some of those skills that are really crucial for the future of our health system. Um, and then the other thing, and I, I was just speaking with Dr. Stander um, before the, the call tonight about the fact that, you know, so much of what organizes our, our clinical care system is dependent on how the money is allocated and how the health system rewards uh, certain types of, of clinical decisions. And so if you are interested in driving certain types of change within the health system, you have to be knowledgeable about those mechanisms. And that's what the fellowship is aiming to do, is it's giving you more insight and understanding uh, to be part of that conversation and actually help make some of those decisions. Yeah, and really, really be a change agent with those collaborations and getting to know all the stakeholders and how you can be that stimulus to help bring them together. There's a comment um, in, in the chat um, to this effect that, that bringing together the mindset of different disciplines can provide a value um, with each bringing their own training based on opinion, background, et cetera, to the final result, which is a win, right? It's a win for yes. the patient as, yes. as one of our attendees points out, but I would say it's a win for us as providers because um, it's a much more fun environment to practice in when you get to have that collaboration and dialogue with your colleagues. Agreed. Yeah. So I, I think there's, there's some, many other questions. Hopefully we'll be able to get you to answer some of them down the road. I think we probably only have time for one other question. And so the sure. last one I'll pose to you is, um, you know, if you, you, you've kind of thought forward to the future at many different points in, in your career path. So I wonder if you could do that again for us with your crystal ball, right? So where's, where's rehabilitation going? And where do you see barriers, if any, to achieving evidence-based care and patient-centered care and truly collaborative care? So where are we going and, and what do we need to do to make sure we get there? Well, that's a great question. And, and I, I wish I did know um, exactly where we were, we were heading with that. But I think in general, um, one thing that we have to do as a field is we've really got to keep our core goal of restoring and improving function at the forefront of what we do um, across our efforts. And I think this is important as, you know, subspecialization becomes more and more um, common. We want to retain that aspect about ourselves, our identity within rehab um, specifically, that makes us unique. And that is thinking through those, those functional needs of patients. Um, that's what makes us different. That's what makes us rehab physicians. And so I think that that's, that's sort of um, specific to our field. Um, and then more generally from there, I think that we've got to come up with new ways of uh, organizing the care of the patient so that it truly is, um, and something Dr. Standard likes to, to really emphasize, um, health promoting. And that is something that's very synergistic with the goals that we have in rehab as well. Um, part of that means, I think, being involved in the discussions around health policy and health economics. And so that's why I think the fellowship that you know, we have here is so novel and important to getting us to the next chapter. Yeah, absolutely agree. It's a complex system. It's a very yeah. complex system. So we, we need leaders like yourself to help us negotiate that system. So we're so thankful for the work that you've done and, and um, thankful that you're a force in the field and, and a change agent. So, you know, it's, it's, I'll bring us back to close here and just thank you again for sharing your perspective on this and sharing your journey. It's awesome to see how much you've accomplished, but also how much you've contributed. Um, at this point in your career. And we know this is just the start and there's so much more to come. So, so thank you so much. I'll turn the program back over to Andy to, to close us out. But thanks again, Dr. Eubanks for, for sharing. Thank you, Dr. Silva.
Yes, Dr. So and Dr. Eubanks, thank you so much for a great presentation and discussion. I uh, hope everyone enjoyed uh, this as much as I did. And uh, for anyone who had a question we were unable to get to today, or if you would like to learn about ways to support the initiatives of the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, please contact me at raz37 at pit.edu. Dr. Soa, Dr. Eubanks, thank you again. And to everyone who joined us, please be on the lookout for future sessions of Rehab Reels and have a good evening and a happy Thanksgiving.